Hello everybody, I'm back, and I'm in a different location this week, but that's because I am out of town on business, and I'm currently in my hotel room, my rather bizarre hotel room, which you can't really see from this view, and I don't feel like taking my laptop and just flapping it around everywhere, but uh, all of the rooms come with this uh, animal print bathrobe. Um, yeah, and that's just a small example of some of the weirdness uh, that's in this rather unique hotel. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing this, you know, on camera. Um, and I won't even tell you what they had in the mini bar, but uh, yeah, um, different location, but as promised, I wanted to do my Sting tribute video, which is something I've been promising for a while. I've been tinkering with the idea and how I was going to do it, and a lot of this is sparked not from the idea that Sting is going to join the WWE, um, which has been talked about a lot, seems to get talked about a lot every year, but um, that isn't what sparked it. What really sparked it for me was getting the WWE Network and getting to watch a lot of that old uh, WCW footage. Um, it brought back a lot of good memories, and naturally, I, I, through watching all of the WCW stuff, I got into a huge... Uh, Sting binge and just started watching a lot of Sting's old stuff and reliving a lot of those memories and it, it kind of reminded me of just how uh, special Sting was to me as a wrestling fan and uh, how he was a big part of my childhood and um, I just wanted to come on here and basically express that. Uh, basically the first time I ever saw Sting um, was in 1991. Up to that point, my only exposure to wrestling had been WWF and stories that my dad told me about Bruno San Martino. That's basically all my exposure to wrestling. And Bruno, of course, is WWF himself. So basically the only wrestling I ever knew was WWF. Um, I didn't know that there were other wrestling companies out there. I didn't watch Ric Flair in the NWA. I didn't watch... I, in fact... And again, this might sound strange, but the first time I ever saw Ric Flair was when he joined the WWF in 1991. I, I had no idea who Ric Flair was, and uh, before you point your fingers at me and call me stupid and a moron and uneducated, keep in mind I was five and six years old when that happened, so <laughs> call me some slack. Um, but one day, uh, in it was I want to say I want to say it was 91, but it might have been 92. Uh, my mom came home one day and gave me a wrestling magazine. I couldn't tell you which magazine it was. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of uh, which publication it was. But uh, she was like, here you go, son. Here's a, here's a wrestling magazine. I know you like that stuff. And I thought maybe you'd enjoy reading this. And right away on the cover uh, was a guy with a blonde flat top and wacky face paint all over. And upon first glance, I thought it was the Ultimate Warrior. Uh, that's who I thought it was. But then as I looked closer, I was like, that's not the warrior. And I, I just kept asking my mom. I'm like, Ma, who is this guy? And she's like, I don't really know. I assumed you did. <laughs> and I, I started looking. I was just mesmerized by the cover. I'm like, I have no idea who this guy is. He's not in the WWF. And I start flipping through the pages. And there's some WWF stuff in the magazine. But there's talk of other things going on in wrestling at the time. And that like fascinated me. I was like, wait a minute, there's wrestling in Japan, there's wrestling um, in other areas of the world, there's other wrestling companies here in America? What is going on? It, it was almost too much for my six-year-old brain to comprehend that there was more wrestling outside of just the WWF. And in that magazine they highlighted two matches uh, through photographs and articles and write-ups. Uh, there was a Hogan Slaughter match that they talked about, which makes me think that's why I think this was in 91, um, to which I groaned, because even by that point at that age, I was getting kind of sick of Hogan Slaughter. It's like, seriously, that feud should have ended at WrestleMania 7. Um, but they also highlighted a match between Sting and somebody else called Big Van Vader. And I'm looking at Vader, I'm like, who the hell is this guy? He looks awesome! He looks like a monster! Looks great! And their pictures were far more interesting than the Hogan Slaughter pictures, and I was just blown away by what I was seeing. And um, it, it was fascinating, to say the least. So I was like, I gotta find out more about Sting and Vader. And that was kind of my thing. I was like, I wanna see this match, and I wanna see 
what these guys are all about. And eventually I did find WCW and I started watching WCW Saturday night, worked it into my regular rotation of uh, weekly viewing. It was actually kind of cool for me to have a Saturday night wrestling show because I mean I didn't have to get up early to watch it <laughs> so it's cool because I was going to be home that day anyway because it's you know it's Saturday and I'm six so where am I going to go so um, yeah I, I thought it was really cool so I started watching it and I immediately Sting became my favorite guy because uh, he was the big hero of the show it was like the reason I liked Hulk Hogan uh, when I was really young and uh, you know the reason he was my big favorite um so I really enjoyed watching Sting, and eventually we got to a point where they were building up a big uh, Sting versus Vader WCW World Title match, um, and that caught my eye right away because I was like, okay, I need to see that pay per view. And the first WCW pay per view I ever watched, ever ordered, that my parents ordered for me, was Great American Bash 1992, which had Sting versus Vader in the world title match. They didn't main event. They gave the main event spot to... Um, basically, the whole pay-per-view was uh, the NWA Tag Team Title Tournament and Sting versus Vader, and that was basically the whole card, and the tournament finals were the main event of the pay-per-view. Um, so, And Sting and Vader was the match before that. But watching this match, I was just blown away because I always liked um, matches. Even at that age, I liked matches of clashing styles. I watched, I, I liked watching uh, big guys fight little guys and um, the type of chemistry that created. It was just something, um, that old David versus Goliath aspect to it I thought was really cool. But uh, Sting and Vader just did it so well. Um, and this is what really caused me to think of Sting as something different from a Hulk Hogan or an Ultimate Warrior. Um, you know, you throw Hulk Hogan up there against somebody like King Kong Bundy or the One Man Gang or, you know, you've seen those matches. Hogan versus the Super Heavyweight. You've seen all those matches. Hogan's going to slam him and Hogan's going to beat him. That's kind of... I, I know the formula. I know what to expect. Sting and Vader, they were going out there and doing these insane moves to each other. I mean, Vader was doing moonsaults, and Sting was slamming him. And not just slamming him, he was just doing these amazing things to Vader, like giving him uh, fallaway slams and stuff. And he was Stinger splashing him all over the place. And it was just these really uh, kind of high-energy, high-impact, uh, really innovative matches that really blew my mind. They were the type of matches I would have expected out of smaller guys, but instead you had Vader... Who was this big monster that was uh, would have great power and would throw Sting around a little bit? So that had an extra element to it. it all the fun of a high flying little guy match, but also with that David versus Goliath type of formula that I really like. So it was really a uh, cool thing for me. And I remember watching that Great American Bash match and just being blown away by it and just thinking, wow, this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And another thing that separated Hogan, uh, or separated Sting from Hogan and the Warriors and the Ultimate Warrior and stuff like that, was Sting actually lost that match. And that shocked me. Uh, because I just kind of expected, oh, well, Sting's the good guy. Sting's going to win because the main event good guy always wins. And he didn't. And actually, in the entire series of Sting Vader matches, um, Sting didn't win very often. He won at Starcade 92, and he won at, I want to say it was Slambury 94. Um, other than that, he didn't win too frequently against Vader. Um, I think he won a couple tag matches as well. I do remember that one uh, Beach Blast pay-per-view where it was him and Bulldog versus Sid and Vader, and I, uh, I'm pretty sure Sting and Bulldog won that match. Um, but, yeah, that was fascinating to me, and that's another thing that... Um, is kind of a problem with John Cena, where if you look, they whenever they have John Cena feud with somebody like a Mark Henry, or a Great Khali, or an Umaga, or you know, basically just throw a monster at John Cena, you know Cena's gonna win. There's no mystery there. It's like yes, he's gonna f you him and show off, or I'm sorry, a a him, and show off how strong he is, and he's gonna beat him, and even if he goes into the match injured, it's not gonna matter because he's gonna overcome the odds and ultimately win so there's really no drama there uh, none at all whatsoever but with Sting and Vader it was actually fascinating to me it was the first series of matches that I ever really got sucked into because um, normally it would just be the one big match and all the rematches would just feel like um, 
you know, lackluster sequels, basically. You get Hogan Andre, and yeah, the second match they had that set up the WrestleMania 4 main event where DiBiase bought the title and all that stuff, that was fun, but they never quite recaptured the magic that they had at WrestleMania 3. Um, Hogan and Warrior only had the one big match, at least until 1998, but uh, we haven't, you know, I, I, that hadn't happened yet, obviously. Um... Hogan and Savage. The WrestleMania 5 match was great. The 1,800 matches they had after that, eh, you know, uh, whatever. Um, so WWF didn't really have a lot of great series of matches that I was really, really got sucked into. Uh, really, the only series of matches that I would watch religiously were tag matches. And it didn't even matter who was in the tag match. I just loved tag matches. Um, so it was really cool to get, like, this big one-on-one -on -one rivalry between these two great characters, and an, uh, I mean, Vader was just this great comic booky, over the top monster, but he also had more of a personality to him because he was kind of cocky. He wasn't just straight up, oh, I'm a cartoony bad guy and I will kill Hulkamania, blah. He was actually kind of a cocky jerk, and so I, I kind of like that aspect to him. It wasn't just, I'm a raving monster. It's uh, it's like, no, I'm, I've got an ego because I'm fucking awesome. I'm Vader. And he had a reason to be egotistical because he, he won most of the time. He was legitimately a winner and a monster, so... Uh, or at least the character was, and it it made for a fun villain, a fun bad guy. And then you had Sting, who very much like Hogan and Warrior, felt like he was cut out of a comic book or a cartoon show or something like that. But he also had was more athletic. He was, um, and because he didn't win all the time, he was more sympathetic and identifiable as a babyface. So he's, I mean, Sting had a lot of great attributes as a as a main event level babyface and it was uh that sting vader matches uh not only were the matches great to watch not only did it have this over the top kind of comic booky element to it not only were they great workers and great characters and uh cut great promos on each other and everything like that but it was also interesting to watch because i didn't know who was going to win and that instantly sucked me in and i you know whenever they did sting and vader on pay-per-view i had to watch it and I wanted to see all of their matches, and I look back on that series of matches very fondly. Uh, their match at Starcade 92, the King of Cable Tournament Finals, that was a great one. Um, their strap match at Super Brawl 3 was awesome, and I, I actually just got done rewatching that one, and I was so... Uh, yeah, that match holds up. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was, it was pretty violent. Um... Uh, their match, I remember the triangle match they had at Fall Brawl 94 with the Guardian Angel, big boss man, uh, Guardian Angel was his WCW gimmick, um, they had a triangle match, not a traditional triple threat match, because I don't think the triple threat match had even been invented by that point, but um, they, what they did is it was a three man series and boss man, and I'm just going to keep calling him boss man, boss man and Vader fought each other first and then Sting had the bye, so it was basically like a mini three man tournament is probably the best way to describe it, and then Sting and Vader fought each other and they had, an, uh, that was their final pay per view match I think, and that match was amazing and it was a great uh, last match for them to have, if, if I'm right, and that was their last match, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, so yeah, those Sting Vader matches, man, those really captured my imagination. It really, uh, um, really got me excited about the WCW product at a time when they really weren't that good. <laughs> I mean, WCW really wasn't that good. Not that WWF was much better at the time. I mean, we were into like really kitty, cartoony phase by this point. But um, Sting was usually a high point for me. I mean, granted, not everything he did was great. I mean, he was paired up with RoboCop. I, I do remember that. Um, but I remember his feud with Luger. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, and I thought they had a really good rivalry heading into Super Bowl too, with the whole friends turned enemies thing and Luger being jealous of Sting's success and stealing the title and all that stuff. I thought all that stuff was great. Um, it was a great angle. The match itself was actually okay, too. It wasn't fantastic, but it was, it was uh, worthy for the buildup that it had. Um, I liked his series of matches with Rick Rude. I thought they uh, typically worked very well together. Um, I especially remember their Clash of Champions match where Sting went into the match hurt. And, oh my god, he lost. What a crazy idea. An injury actually costs you a match. Um, that's another thing that a lot of babyfaces do. And, and I, I hate to keep ragging on John Cena, but it's like they'll go into a match hurt 
and then they win anyway so it's like the injury meant nothing um, when the injury is actually your excuse to have them lose and get heat on the heel that's beating them but whatever um, but yeah I really liked his work with Rick Rude and actually Rick Rude's work in WCW there, there's another guy you really want to see how good Rick Rude was watch him in WCW because he was uh, just fantastic um, and as I tried to collect more and more of, of Sting's matches and footage and uh, things of that nature that led me into um, I don't want to say tape trading but I had a guy I had a guy who could hook me up with the tape every now and then and I'd watch something from like the late 80s with Sting. Uh, that's how I found out about his matches with the great Muda. And I really liked those matches too and it really caught my attention. It's like, wow, this great Muda guy is pretty good too. Where's, what's his story? Where does he come from? Well, he wrestles in Japan. I'm like, there's wrestling in Japan. Interesting. Okay. And that introduced me to Japanese wrestling. And again, I'm not a regular viewer of Japanese wrestling today, but uh, it is fun to watch once in a while. I love the presentation. I love the in-ring style. I love uh, so many things about Japanese wrestling. If only I could understand what the hell they were saying. <laughs> I would probably watch it all the time, but the language barrier is an issue. But um, by having watched those Sting Muda matches, it really did... Uh, make me want to see more Japanese wrestling and find out more about it and find out what the deal was and what was going on. Um, I also found out about Sting's matches with Ric Flair and that ultimately led to me finding about about uh, finding out about what Ric Flair meant to the NWA and what his legacy was and I found the matches with Steamboat which are some of my favorite matches. I love uh, and of course I was happy to find more uh, stuff with Ricky Steamboat on it because uh, just watching him in the WWF I was a big Ricky Steamboat fan and so when I saw all this other stuff that Ricky had done I was really happy with that too um, and then it got me you know more and more and more and I started picking up more magazines and I read about the Von Erichs I was like wait there's more than one Von Erich I thought Carrie was the only one again WWF I only knew the Texas Tornado and I found out about the whole Von Erich family and then I discovered um, uh, the Von Erich Freebirds feud and some of the stuff that they did there and I got to see a little bit of that stuff so um, really, through Sting, it, that really was kind of the gateway into finding out more about wrestling's history and finding out more about, uh, you know, the, the guys that I'd already had watched, like Steamboat and Flair, and really find out where they came from and what they did and, uh, you know, find some of their best work, quite honestly. Uh, showed me because of sting it showed me wrestling in japan and that wrestling has a worldwide presence that i wasn't aware of at six years old um you know a lot of things like that and um that's something i always attribute to sting is that he was the guy you know guys like hulk hogan and randy savage and jake roberts and ted dibiase and roddy piper mr perfect bret hart Shawn michaels undertaker all those guys they made me WWF fans, but it was Sting who made me a wrestling fan. And I, I you know, obviously I credit Vader with that as well, but um, Sting was the first guy I noticed outside of the WWF um, uh, that really opened my eyes to a lot of the other stuff that was going on in wrestling and what had happened before that point and really got me interested in researching and finding out more about wrestling as I you know I just got to a point where I couldn't get enough of it I just had to keep finding out more and more and more and I just loved it I loved every bit of it and because of Sting I mean I don't know what I have even found out about um, the NWA or wrestling in Japan or WCW if I if my mother hadn't given me that magazine of Sting I, I mean I'm sure I would have found out about WCW eventually because they did once the NWO kicked in they became really hot but um, and I'm sure once Hogan went there in 94 I would have heard something but uh, you know Sting was uh, a good first person to watch outside of the WWF to really get me interested in wrestling in general and of course other matches of his that I really liked uh, you know the stuff he did with Cactus Jack I thought was really good um, I think he could have done some great stuff with Jake Roberts but I think Roberts was kind of falling off the wagon at that point and um, the one match they did have was the spin the wheel make the deal Halloween Havoc match which was a missed opportunity because the match they decided on was the coal miners glove match which come on I, <laughs> come on that's the most boring match you could possibly pick 
Um, you know, his matches with Flair, the 45-minute draw, the Clash of Champions, that's a great one. Um, him beating Flair for the title at the Great American Bash, that's another really good one. Um, and as the years went on, even after guys like Hogan and all of them, and, uh, you know, they were doing things like the Dungeon of Doom and other stupid crap like that, I still watched WCW mainly for Sting, because I really was a Sting mark, and I liked Sting. Um, and then once the NWO kicked in, it kind of really changed the landscape of everything. It made me wonder, it's like, okay, where's Sting going to fit into all this? And of course, Sting completely reinvented himself and became the Crow, uh, basically with the face pain and hanging up in the rafters and coming down from the rafters. And um, I mean, that time in wrestling where he targeted the NWO was some of the best programming that WCW had ever produced. I mean, you, and it was great because Sting wasn't there every week, every week, so you didn't know when he was going to show up. And when he did, it was a big deal. Um, even if it was just something simple, like him pointing his baseball bat at Hogan. Um, but when he did that thing at uh, Uncensored 97, where he showed up at the end of the pay-per-view and beat the hell out of the NWO, that was awesome. My favorite moment in Nitro history was when Sting came down to the ring to attack the NWO with the Sting army and all the people in the Sting masks and everything. And the NWO just keeps knocking them down left and right, but they just keep coming and coming. And everything is just getting nutty and crazy, and Stings are everywhere. And then all of a sudden, Buff Bagwell punches one of the Stings, and he no-sells it. And you know right then and there, that's the real Sting. And it, it was such a fantastic moment, and I loved it. And I loved a lot of the stuff that they did with the Crow Sting. I um, mean, that build-up leading into his match with Hogan at Starcade 1997 was uh, one of the finest pieces of booking I'd ever seen in any wrestling company. It was one of the best storylines, some of the best moments, some of the best wrestling programming. It was just excellent. The match sucked, and they booked that horribly. But the build-up was really good, and I already ranted on my last video talking about how Super Brawl 8 was, uh, you know, that the match done right, but two months too late, and, uh, God, it's not worth reliving. Um, but yeah, and but even as WCW, WCW went into its decline, Sting was always a constant. You could always rely on Sting to... Uh, at least try to put something good in there. Like, his feud with Vampiro in 2000 wasn't very good, but you got the sense that Sting was trying to make something out of it. Um, 1999 was the worst year in the company's history, but he had an outstanding uh, world title match with Diamond Dallas Page on an episode of Nitro. And he had some matches with Bret Hart, which those were dream matches for me. They never quite had that great match that I always wanted out of them, but it was nice that that match at least happened. Uh, Bret and Hogan never happened, for God knows what reason. Um, but uh, you always got the sense that Sting was trying his best and trying to make every little thing that was going on, uh, tried to make it work, and tried to make it an interesting story. But um, once WCW was sold, he did not go to the WWF, which... Um, you know, if they wanted to do that Sting-Undertaker match, probably 2001, 2002 would have been the time to do it because that would have been, uh, you know, both men would have still been in reasonably uh, good shape to put on a really good match that you would expect them to have. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want that match now. I, I don't know if you've seen what Sting looks like now. but And it's, again, Stinger, I love you, but you have to wear a T-shirt to the ring. There's a reason for that. And if you have to wear a T-shirt to the ring, you probably shouldn't be wrestling. And, and don't even get me started on Undertaker and uh, what he looked like at WrestleMania 30. But um, I don't want that match to happen now. But back then, it would have been awesome. Um, instead, uh, Sting seemed to go away for a couple years, and it was, you know, made me wonder, is he ever going to go to WWF? Is he ever going to do anything? Well, he showed up in TNA uh, for brief spots in 2003, and then he started another run, uh, another big run in 2005 after they'd gotten onto Spike TV. And Sting, once again, um, always tried his best with TNA, and I think he brought a level of credibility to the product that... Um, I'm not saying TNA was desperate for, but he, he Sting definitely helped them um, in those early months that they were on Spike TV, and I felt like uh, he contributed very well. He was having reasonably good matches for someone of his age, um, and the storylines and the angles that he was involved with were typically pretty solid, uh, or at least his work in them were pretty solid. Like I loved a lot of the stuff he did with Jared. Uh, his feud with Abyss, they did some ridiculous things, but Sting, again, did his best to make it 
work. Um, some of the stuff he did with Angle was really good. The stuff he did with AJ tended to be really good. In the main event, Mafia, even though they, you know, fucked that angle up royal um, a lot of times, um, Sting was really good in it. Uh, the stuff he did with Mick Foley leading into lockdown. The match was eh, but the, the build-up was amazing. I mean, those are so probably... Uh, the best promos that TNA's ever put on their television product. And uh, for the time he was there, I felt like Sting did contribute to TNA and was a at least a source of credibility. Um, and uh, typically he did he did reasonably well there. And towards the end, he was looking a bit old, and um, it was probably time for him to go. But even then, it was like every now and then he'd throw out a crazy, like that insane match he had with Bully Ray last year uh, where they ripped the ring apart. I mean, that match was nuts. But... Um, overall, uh, Sting's wrestling career has been a, a damn good one, to say the least. And if he does go to the WWF, I'm hoping he doesn't wrestle, because like I said, I don't think, um, I, I just don't think he has it physically anymore. Um, like I said, the last, the last year and a half he was in TNA was a little iffy, but, um, uh, no, I would like him to go to the Hall of Fame. That would be awesome. Uh, there's, To be honest, and maybe this is just weird, I don't know. There's a part of me that wants him to go to the WWF, but there's an... Or WWE, sorry. Uh, like Warrior said, get the... I wish they'd get the F and F back in. <laughs> you know. Uh, thanks for that line, Warrior. Um, um, where was I going with that? Yeah, but um, there's that part of me that wants Sting to go to the WWE... But there's another part of me, because I always knew Sting as a guy that was outside of the WWE, there's a part of me that never wants him to go there. Because I just want him to have that, that he is the biggest star in wrestling history that never wrestled a match for Vince McMahon. I think that's really cruel. And really a, a, a cruel. I meant cool. I don't know why I said cruel. But uh, it's really a testament to Sting's ability and Sting's uh, longevity in the business. And... Uh, um, what he's meant to wrestling and to all of us fans, that he's able, been able to make a name for himself without any help from Vince McMahon. I, I think that's really interesting and really cool. And if they put him in the WWE Hall of Fame without ever working a match with uh, in the WWE, that would be amazing. I, I think that's pretty amazing that Sting built this entire career that's Hall of Fame worthy, and he did it... Um, without without the WWE marketing machine. So that's pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, here's hoping the Stinger um, does get that Hall of Fame spot one day because I think that would be a really good one to have. Um, especially since the WWE has definitely expanded it to go not just to WWE history but to wrestling in general. So uh, Sting fits right in there, and I think Sting absolutely belongs in there. But, um, yeah, so basically that's it with my tribute. I just want to come on here and just talk about what Sting meant to me personally as a wrestling fan and, and, and basically credit him for being the guy that made me a wrestling fan uh, and made me find and discover new things outside of the WWE. And, um, you know, it really goes to show that uh, one of the worst excuses I've ever heard for people, um, wrestling fans, or wrestling fans, to not watch a wrestling product is when they look at the roster and say, I don't know who any of these people are. Well, at one time, you didn't know who Hulk Hogan was, you didn't know who Randy Savage was, you didn't know who The Rock or Steve Austin or any of those guys were. You didn't know those people. Um, you discovered them, you found them, and you... You know, either liked them or you didn't like them or whatever. Uh, so when I hear people say, well, I don't know who these people are, and I'm like, well, why don't you watch the show and find out who they are? Um, that doesn't make sense. And, uh, you know, Sting was kind of the guy that caught me that. Here's a guy that had no ties to the WWE, WWF at the time, and all it took was one magazine cover to really open my eyes and really, you know, catch my attention and make me want to see more. Uh, whether it be the multi you know, the multicolored face painted blonde uh, surfer sting or the crow sting or the red and black painted sting or um, whatever look he was going for. Um, sting has always been a reminder for me that there's other wrestling out there besides the WWE. And, uh, you know, it's always good to check it out, even if it's just once in a while. Um, if uh, there's that indie fed that's got a lot of attention or if there's a new wrestling show coming on TV or anything like that, check it out. See if you like it. and uh, You might find yourself your own sting. Uh, that'll really uh, win you over and make you a big fan and uh, really give you something to be entertained by. So basically that's 
that's my tribute to Sting. Thank you for everything, Stinger. You were awesome. You are awesome. Uh, thank you for being awesome. And uh, that's all I have for now. So until then, I will see you all later.